Thanks for having me up here. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about that. So, for the observers, I don't know what you guys were told, but just watching, uh, how do you think you get out of the maze? Or uh, participants know they all, they all finally got out, but yeah, how do you get out of the maze? Ask for help. Ask for help. Okay, now, participants, um, what, what was your mindset like when that was going on? Were you thinking, I'm for sure gonna get in there and ask for help? Like, where was that at in your priority list when you got in there? Anyone, there was four of you, so I can call you out. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like giving up? Okay. Obviously confusing, right? Like it just looked like mass confusion to you guys. Sitting out here, right? Like, oh, I don't know if this kid just climbed a table, right? Like, it looks like confusion. Anyone else? Any other participants? What do you guys think? Yeah. I was afraid that it was a joke and that it could be like only I was blindfolded. Yeah. <laughs> Based on the table game that was a couple weeks ago, I can see how you would think that. Okay. Okay. So a little bit odd to ask for help, okay? So athletes have this weird thing about asking for help, right? Um, I mean, we get in there and you're down to like one, and I've seen this game done before where it's like, all right, one more South Maze, people are like, like going faster, like I gotta get out, like do this, don't work harder, right? Like, I got this, but no, the asking for help's not on the list. So why do you think that is? Just shout outs. Why do you think that is that we struggle with help? Pride. Stubborn. Pride, stubborn. What do you think is specific to athletes that makes it hard to ask for help? Weak. Competitive, right? That's great stuff. Um, I got a couple down here. Um, I have kind of just like the general college age where like you kind of get to school, it's like, all right, you're out from underneath mom and dad's wings here. You kind of, you need to figure it out on your own. You need to figure out life, right? Um, I've had people say like hard coaches, like my coach is like, all right, just do your job, right? Like just here's the system, no questions, figure it out. Or I'll like put the next man up in, right? Um, and even work ethic, we have like this super idolized version of what work ethic is. And don't get me wrong, like I love work ethic. I'll be the first one to attest to that, like how much I admire that and my teammates, how much I tried to embody that when I played back in the day, last year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we kind of idolize work ethic to the point where it's like, if I, if I work really hard, like if I put six plates on and squat it, like nothing is gonna be denying me. Like I'm gonna play a national championship, right? Like we're just like greedy like that, right? <laughs> I, I did that. I did that once. Um, so, so the whole point here is that like it's a thing that athletes struggle to ask for help. Like we struggle to surrender. Like it's not just a weird thing. Like I had one guy come in here and he was like, "Well, I figured I'd like at least exhaust my options, right? Like I'd get in and like, you know, look at every nook and cranny of this maze, which is like a poorly set up maze on purpose, right?" Um, I know that's pretty convincing. Yeah, yeah, it looked great in there, right? I did it with like an X set of rope, like just two ropes, and people were like, they found, I don't, I don't even know how they found all those options. But yeah, one kid was like, I gotta get in here, I thought I'd at least like, you know, look at every nook and cranny, right? And then I'd ask for help at that point, as like a last resort. So the whole essence of principle three is surrendering, and how we surrender, um, and knowing that if I need to grow, I need to give up control kind of odd, right? You want to grow, but that requires giving up control. And so I thought before we address that, um, we should probably bring to the surface this propensity for athletes to seize that control uh, of their circumstances, of their sport, um, and that unwillingness to give it up and to let God uh, take over and kind of do a redemptive work, do a reconstruction in us. We want to grow, yet we don't want to like change or give it up. Like we'll sit in this maze, like just like death gripping it. And so, um, kind of to go along with that, um, we bring brokenness into our relationship with Christ. Like Sandra just talked about it, right? We bring brokenness in. Um, so don't think that there's not brokenness in you that needs to be redeemed when you come to that relationship. Right? So you, when you come in, it's be willing to call, call what you do into question. Starting with sport, right? We're talking about sport. Be willing to call the way you operate your sport into question, right? Like, okay, I normally get like super frustrated when we're losing. When I wasn't scoring, I get super frustrated, I'll be honest. And when I came into my relationship with Christ, that was like the first thing I wanted to give up and be like, all right, this is what I've been doing, what do you say? Like, what, how should I do it based on what you teach? So we're gonna talk about that, talk about surrender, and we basically break it up in two different things. Like, what does that even mean then? What does surrender even mean? Who am I surrendering to? And the first thing is the word of God, and I don't have my clicker in the five minutes that I had in my hand. <laughs> you wanna help me out there? Oh, God, that's great, okay. <laughs> Um, so the Word of God, what is it? Okay. Um, 2 Timothy 
says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so what is this basically? Obviously, it's the word of God. It's his word to us. It tells us who God is and who we are in relationship to him. And that's super important. But more specifically for this talk, what I want to talk about is um, how we're supposed to live, like what it, what it looks like. Um, you know, a lot of times, and I'll show you, I think I have it a couple slides down, um, but Psalm 119, we're going to come back to it, um, but it says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. And I know that sounds kind of weird to be like, oh, I love a law, like you love rules, like that's kind of weird. And we, we have this tendency to like condense, oh, yes. thank you so much. Um, I think that's, yeah, okay. Um, I haven't gone through this presentation with my slides yet, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Go 20 minutes and like click 14 slides down, and there's the end, okay. Um, okay, so Psalm, Psalm 119, oh, how I love your law. I think I got it on the, okay, sure. Um, meditate on it all day, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. Okay, so law sounds weird to say like I love it. That's weird, we think of rules as like not cool, right? And that's because we have a tendency to kind of limit the law to a set of do's and don'ts and get legalistic and I gotta do this and I gotta don't, don't do that, basically. And that's not really how it works. A lot of times in the Bible, actually, uh, the law or the word of God is referred to as true. And if you really think about that, that's kind of like a weird thing to say if you think of the law as just do's and don'ts. Like it'd be really weird if I was like, all right, jump up and down. And you were like, ugh, true. You got me, right? Like that doesn't, that doesn't work. Like that's not how command, so, commands work. So it's called truth. So that means the word of God is based on truth. And what that means is that if God is the creator, he has created a way on this earth. If he knows the exact context for which that, that world is supposed to exist, then he knows the way in which to live in it. That is most appropriate for that context. And basically what I'm trying to say with a lot of big words is the Bible is our playbook. The Bible is the way to live this life that's most appropriate for that context, right? It's just like a coach that puts together an offensive system, defensive system, whatever your sport puts in a playbook and has you read it because that sets you up. They know that going into that game, if you know that playbook, you put yourself in the best position to win that game. And that's what the Bible is. So the first thing you have to do as far as training is study it, right? And we're coming back to this, to this psalm, right? I love your lie. Meditate on it all day, right? And this kind of alludes to the second point, which is to store it. Okay, so it's more than just like seeing the app on your phone and being like, great, cool, checked off the list, I did the verse of the day, right? It's about <laughs> meditating on it. I love that word choice, meditating on it. It's like soaking it in, right? Like I'm keeping it within me. And look at the result. He says it makes me wiser than my enemies, right? It's the, it's the playbook. And every day is game day when you're a Christian, right? Like you're not going to face temptation tomorrow. You're not going to face hardship tomorrow, right? You're facing it now every single day. When you wake up, every day is game day. So you've got to study it and you've got to store it, right? Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's lethal, man. Like when you can store the word of God, and when you're in trial, and you can recite the word of God, that is lethal for the enemy. But at the same time, it keeps you in check, right? It judges your thoughts and attitudes. Like it keeps you in check too, okay? And that kind of leads me into the second piece, the other thing that keeps you in check, is the Spirit of God. And that's a lot of type up there. I'm going to go ahead and read through that now. Um, so John uh, kind of gives us, well, Jesus in John, um, kind of gives us an idea of what the Spirit is, what the Spirit does for us. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. And that goes back to the Word of God, right? So um, this goes back to do's and don'ts. Like, if you love him, Keep his commands. You gotta know his commands. Like we don't love to earn salvation. We love as a result of it, as a response to it, right? So if you love me, you'll keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Advocate to help you and be with you forever. Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He lives with you, uh, and will be with you. And then again at 26, it says, "But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name." will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So first thing, oh, darn. Okay, I'll just read it off. Um, so the first thing that the Spirit does is lives in us. And let's just understand the implications of that. 
because that's pretty powerful. The living God, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, lives in you every single day. I mean, we live in the time to be alive. Back in Jesus' day, he was the only one that could do this. So the only people who got the benefit of the Spirit were the 12 disciples, because they were the only ones that were around Jesus all the time. They were the only ones that could constantly have um, that counsel, that rebuking, teaching, reminding that it mentions in John. They were the only ones that could get that, because they were the only ones that were around Jesus all the time. But now, by his, his ascending, he has poured out the Spirit to everyone. So now, every waking moment of every day, you have this power source within you to help you throughout your day. And we have a tendency to sit in, in this maze and try and figure it out on our own first. I'm going to exhaust all my options first, and then I'll come to you when I, when I know that I've tried and it didn't work out. Or maybe even that still doesn't come up as an option, right? Maybe we'll climb tables first before, <laughs> before we ask for help. Sorry, I'm done chirping you now about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have this power source in us and we have a tendency to quench it. And I have a great example of that from Julie, our own Julie. Um, if you can ima imagine three different glasses of milk, and if you've heard this before, sorry, I'm gonna belabor it. Um, but the first glass, they all represent people, right? First glass of milk is just regular, right? Regular person, non-believer. Okay, and they take the second glass of milk and regular milk and they decide to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so, boom, they get the spirit, that's chocolate syrup, right? Nothing better than chocolate syrup for milk. Doesn't get any better than that. Okay, so they dump the syrup in, but they decide, you know what? I'm still in control of this. I'm a, I got me, okay? So the syrup just sinks to the bottom. And they're not changed at all. And to be honest, they don't really even look that different from the first person. But the third dude, he decides, all right, I'm going to accept Christ. And he gets that chocolate syrup, and he's like, all right, Redeem it. Like, I'll let you do a completely restorative work. He stirs it up. Says, all right, spirit, you got control. I like to think of it as wide open. I drive a stick shift. It's when you shift gears and hit the gas really hard. It's like, Rrr. it's like, that's the spirit in me, right? Okay? That's what I call my wide open, right? Like, I'm praying before a game. I'm like, all right, you're wide open. I'm not that good at hockey, right? No. <laughs> okay, but anyways, at the end of the day, all to say, I got chocolate milk in that third one. All right? Now, that is, chocolate milk is what I refer to as John 10.10. When he says, I came that they might have life and life abundantly. All right? There's nothing more abundant when it comes to milk than chocolate milk. Okay? <laughs> so now what? Okay, so, now, so how do we tap into this power source? How do we, how do we tap into that chocolate milk? Dang it. <laughs> um, so it's a continual process. I think I'm a few slides back. Uh, kind of. Okay, yeah. No, perfect. So it's a continual process. of. I actually have sheets on the table. I think... Uh, there's some fill-ins. Probably a terrible time to mention that, but I think <laughs> if you have questions about that later, I don't even know. We're like halfway down the sheet now. Um, okay, so how we train it. Um, so it's a continual process of repentance, which was my least favorite Bible word when I became Christian because it was scary. But repentance just means you're walking this way and you turn around towards the better thing. I think I did that wrong. I think it's just turning around, right? Is it just turning around? Okay, good. Yeah. So that's what that is. It's a continual process of repentance, basically stopping in your way and turning the other way. So what that means is when you're walking, um, or I should say just living your life, and you come to a, the opportunity <laughs> to say yes to your temptation, um, or you're faced with temptation, I'll just leave it that simple. Like you're in a game, and you want to get super frustrated and shut down. That happened to me a lot. Um, I turn into like a really bad teammate and just be like, like on the bench, <laughs> and no one can talk to me. Um, when you're faced with that, are you going to say yes to that temptation or are you going to say yes to God, right, or the flesh? And so this is what this, these verses are talking about. So it says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, it goes on, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't inherit that life abundantly. They won't get chocolate milk. And none of that sounds good, right? Like, none of that's, like, desirable. Like, oh, I want to go, I want to be so envious today that it just, like, kills me, right? Like, <laughs> no one wants that. Like, the, and, but that's what happens when we, like, chase after our own, our own ambition. When you go after the desires of the flesh, it seeks its own glory. And that's where it lands you. So now the next one, the sweet one, is the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 23 times the amount of gentleness God, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Chelsea, like that one. 
I should have paid attention to that. Okay. Um, against such thing, there is no law. So um, this is kind of the way, like this is the way we want to choose. And this isn't going to be perfect. Okay, and that's kind of the key thing here is like it's not perfect and it's not linear, which I think is how athletes think. We think we're not going to make mistakes, but every single time we get faced with a temptation, I'm saying no. And then linear means once I beat it once, I won't ever have to like face it again. Like I conquered it, right? Like we think of walking the stairs, right? Like when you take a step up the stairs, you don't like step down three just because you want to and then keep going, right? Like you step up the stairs continually and don't go to the last one. But that's not how it is. This is cyclical. It's a constant process of repenting and choosing the fruit of the spirit and not the acts of the flesh. So how do we pull, oh, so that's that, okay. So how do we pull all of this together? How do we live this out? Um, so we got word of, the, uh, word of God, which I didn't really go into this too much, but you know, find a routine with that, or if you're, you know, you get too tense with routines, break a routine. I kind of have to mix things up a little bit. But um, if you don't know, if you're new to the Bible and you don't know the best place to start, like our staff is great with helping with that. They've, you got the Bible out with a bunch of plans. So I don't really touch on that too much when it came to the Word of God. Um, but find a routine, like get in the Word, you got to know it, right? So when it comes to now living it, um, we have these four things. And I really want to touch on prayer. Um, yeah. So I really want to touch on prayer because this is something that's been super important in my life. Um, this year, uh, and so I can't help but just kind of impart some of the some of the fruit that I've seen um, from my taking prayer more seriously in this season. Um, prayer, I used to always think of as like a thing you tacked in at the end, right? Like, okay, yeah, pray it out. Like, I'll, you know, I, I hate to minimize it because I, it is important to like pray before games, but I just be like, okay, God, like, thanks for this game. Help me play good, you know, or like. <laughs> I don't know, like I'd like, oh God, help me like not judge her next time. Right? Like I just like they were like quick fixes or like something that's like more serious. I'd be like, okay, God, I'm like super worried about my job and like I'm, you know, becoming a real person next year and like can you just like give me an interview tomorrow? Or like I'm about to do it my quiet time, just like reveal the wisdom in these verses, right? Uh, and I kinda wanted like quick fixes like that. Um, but prayer has the power to be way deeper. Um, more longer thinking and way more reconstructive and redemptive than a quick fix. And I think a lot of times we narrow prayer down into I pray it here, I expect my answer roughly here, like a day later, this weekend for my games, training, um, or we just like expect it in the context that like we expect it. Like, okay, I like, okay, honest example, I wanted to be an Olympian. I read back through my Bible or my journal. Um, of, like all the times I did quiet times and all my prayers were like so like in that time Like I had a year basically to be an Olympian, which was pretty stressful for that year because I just wasn't seeing it <laughs> happen um, But like it just like all my prayers were like that year Okay, like next week God I need to like or next month or I need to hear from so-and-so coach that right here God um, And it's just so much deeper than that So I took the time this season to get like way more strategic with prayer and like way more serious and like longer thinking way more impactful um, and I want to read you I actually read this book circle makers it's about talks about prayer I recommend it if this sounds interesting to you guys at all um, but just to kind of go along with what I'm talking about here um, I'm kind of a numbers freak so I geeked out a little bit about this you guys might just lose it but here's kind of what I'm talking about in one minute light travels 11 million miles in one day light travels 160 billion miles in one year Light travels an unfathomable 5 trillion, 865 billion, 696 million miles. That's just one light year. The outer edge of the universe, according to astrophysicists, is 15 and a half billion light years away. Now, if that seems incomprehensible, it's because it's virtually unimaginable. Yet God says that this is the distance between his thoughts and our thoughts, right? So my ways and my thoughts are higher than your ways. So here's my thought. Your best thought on your best day falls 15 and a half billion light years short of how great and how good God really is. Even the most brilliant among us underestimate God by 15 and a half billion light years. I don't know what that's so. 15 and a half billion light years is how, like, that's like 40 million zeros. You know, like that's, we fall so short what we expect. We serve a God that can do 
exceedingly more than we can ever think or imagine. And we pray like for this week, right? 15 and a half billion light years short. So when you pray, don't just pray that God will help you stay focused on him and glorifying him in competition. Ask him to search your heart and redeem the parts of your heart that keep him from honoring, keep you from honoring him, right? Like that's a process, like search my heart, that's dangerous, right? Don't just ask him to help you stop with envy or jealousy, or better yet, don't just ask him to help me get in the word more. Ask him for your love, for him to grow wiser. That your understanding of his grace and his mercy, his character, would make your love abound, right? Like, ask to be redeemed and restored. Like, like I said, we came into this relationship with Christ with brokenness. Don't think it's not still in there, right? Like, pray serious. All right, now on the second one, community. Okay, we're doing great on time. Um, community is huge. I personally believe you hit, like, a spiritual ceiling. Um if you don't have community. It's called the body of Christ for a reason. You can't like take a part of the body out and expect it to function, right? So it's not just hard to live this life without community. It's like impossible, if you ask me. Um, getting involved in AIA, I'm not gonna lie. I used to say, if you would ask me two years ago, I'd be like, yeah, AIA is all right. But that's because I came in every week by myself and just sat there silent, maybe got involved in one conversation, walked out the door. So yeah, of course it wasn't, at Life Changing. Um, last year, I decided to get involved in the action groups, um, the men's and women's Bible studies that AIA has. I decided to go to Puerto Rico, which was huge and on a whim, and if you're nervous about that, good, because you should be. That's the Holy Spirit in you, just go. <laughs> um, but I, did, I made some changes, and I got, like, I was intentional, and I wouldn't back down. And I decided these were gonna be part of my schedule, and I was gonna, make my community bigger. Up until last year, I had 23 other, 24 other friends, pretty much, in college. I had my 23 teammates, and one NARP that lived next to me. <laughs> she would get so mad at me if she found out that I just called her a NARP. Um, she's my best friend now, but that, that was it. That's what I had. I had my team, and that was it. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna be here next year. I'm screwed. Like, <laughs> if I like, if I'm gonna be here a whole year and like, what, just sit in my room and, and not even that. I mean, that's kind of like service level. But I really wanted to grow spiritually too. And I, I, all I could hear about was just this enriching community. And everyone was talking about how great AIA was. And I was like, what am I missing out on? Like, what, you know, like what? I'm not, I'm not seeing it. And that literally changed the trajectory of my life. I mean, Kelsey said it perfectly. Like, Puerto Rico changed my life completely. Like. The, the entire trajectory. So that's huge. Um, serving others, sorry, I'm kind of like whipping through these last ones, um, which is terrible because serving others is like a super big point. <laughs> um, but serving others, right? Like that's like what Jesus said, like the least of these shall inherit the kingdom, right? Whoever is least of these. Um, serving others is very, very important. I mean, that is a reflection of Jesus. Um, and then lastly, evangelism. Tell people about your story, right? AIA gives you plenty of opportunities to learn how to tell your testimony, um, learn how to engage others. You guys have a team of people that you can talk to. Granted, I know your teammates are like super hard. Um, now that I'm not on the team, I like look back and realize like it actually is a challenge. Like, you're hard on yourselves because you're like, you're my teammates, man, I should be able to talk to them, but it's actually, I'll give you that room, it's pretty hard. But that being said, like you have a team of people to talk to about your story, about how God is changing your life. Like that is, I mean, Luke, one of my, one of my biggest sections this last year is in Puerto Rico was in Luke, it said like the, there's one thing that's necessary. And that's Jesus, you know? Of all the things you could be worrying and concerning yourself about, there's one thing that's necessary in this entire earth at any given moment, and it's Jesus, right? And your teammates need that. People need that. You have it, right? So um, to sum up, <laughs> um, we need to start giving up control. We need to stop walking around in this maze thinking, I got it, just give me five more minutes, right? Like, and I'm not... I'm not saying walk out this door like I'm not taking on the step until it's the spirit in me, right? <laughs> but like, like call it into question, right? Like call it into question. The way you operate, get those dangerous prayers rolling. Like search my heart. I want to be different for your kingdom, right? So we're going to break up into groups here, do some uh, discussion. Um, and I don't have it up here. Um, I don't think, yeah. Um, but the kind of question I think would be good to start chewing on um, is what are you afraid to surrender? Or what... 
what aren't you surrounding that you might not even realize it? Like, think about those types of things, right? What can you be praying? Anyways, that's more questions. Just think about what you aren't <laughs> surrendering right now. Like, what are you afraid to give up, or what aren't you giving up for other reasons in small groups? Sweet. Thank you for having me up here, by the way. You guys rock.